Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series. I hope you and your businesses are thriving no matter where you may be in the world. My name is Sal Capizzi, former spa director and director of marketing here at Book for Time and the host of the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series. Today, I am joined by a true force in the spa industry. Recently Thank named you. Hall of Wellness's Global Wellness Personality of the Year, I'm here today with the one and only Nigel Franklin, AKA the Spa Whisperer, a unique visionary wellness influencer and veteran of the global luxury wellness industry. Renowned for his innovative approach to both concept development and wellness design, but it doesn't end there. He is also the co-founder of his own sustainable product line called Moss of the Isles and Moss Wellness Consulting. Nigel, thank you so much for being a part of the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series today. Hey, Sal. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? Of course. I'm great. I'm great. How are yeah. you doing? Doing well. Doing really well. Coming to the, coming to the final part of my day, so I'm doing good. <laughs> and I am just starting my day. Thank you for joining us from Munich, by the way. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for asking me to, to come of on. Of course. Now, for over 20 years, you have stood you have stood at the forefront of innovation uh, of the wellness evolution, working extensively around the world with some of the most iconic luxury properties in the industry, including Four Seasons, George V in Paris, the Siam in Bangkok, and Amman Resorts. Recently, you headed the redevelopment of the medical aesthetics and wellness centers at Clinique La Prairie in Switzerland. Now, today we're going to discuss a topic that is on everyone's minds, especially in the hospitality industry, and that is staffing. It's no secret that your spot is as only as successful as the team working in it and the culture within it. And I know we all want the best teams in place at the right times of the day that are really masters of their craft. Now, fortunately, most practitioners are in it for the long run, and they have done everything over the years from continuing education to practicing with great body mechanics to ensure their longevity in this industry. But some properties are still struggling to put the proper teams in place to be considered fully staffed, to be able to run at full capacity and generate the most revenue for both the business and for their practitioners. Now, Nigel and I are both massage, licensed massage therapists, and although we don't practice too much anymore, we have practiced for over 10 years and probably a bit longer than that. So it's safe to say we know what we loved and what we didn't like so much working as practitioners. Now, for me, pay was always number one because I love to eat and pay my rent on time. But second to that, feeling heard was always important to me. You know, I've had managers tell me what I was going to do, and I've had managers ask me what I thought was best for maximizing the benefits of the treatments and for maximizing revenue for the business. Dealing with these types of thought processes from leadership so early on in my career, I think that's what inspired me to get into the spa management and business management side of things. Now, Nigel, how do you think recruiting practitioners has shifted both pre and post pandemic? Do you find that businesses and brands are shifting recruiting and staff retainment efforts? Um, I, I do, it's a good question actually. Um, the American uh, Massage Therapy Association has they released some statistics that um, during the pandemic, something like 16% of massage therapists found alternative work. Um, um, while 95% have come back to it. However, the people's perception of their own reality, of their own lives has changed, right? So um, the, the pandemic has taught us two fundamental lessons. It's taught us a lesson on our own mortality, and it's taught us a lesson on <clears throat> the kind of fragility of society itself, because everything we knew was taken away. So I think, from the side of a therapist, priorities had shifted. And so when spa directors and hotels are recruiting therapists, now they have to be um, more mindful and certainly more open to things like um, flexible hours, part-time hours. So it's not so much a, I, I think the industry kind of approached staffing, therapy staffing as a nine to five. And 
you know, we're emotional people. We went through, all went through something collectively. It was super emotional, super isolating. And so, yeah, I think from the side, the perspective of the therapists, their the priorities have shifted. And so when recruiting, we have to take into consideration that shift. Yeah. So I do, I, I do think from that perspective that, that um, recruiters, spas, spa directors, um, are definitely moving to a space where they're more open to those kind of fluctuations of what was the norm. Absolutely, and I think those those statistics that you had just um, that you had just called out that ninety five percent of the specific workforce has gone back to work. That's a really good number, but yeah. and uh, but on the flip side, you know, of that, you know, practitioners, well, I want to say probably the top five hardest hardest hit by you know the pandemic of 2020 and everybody really kicked it into survival mode you know finding different areas that they could you know potentially pivot into during that time but you know that number you know 95 percent of that specific workforce you know going back specifically into you know what they've spent years you know perfecting and practicing um i do think that's a really good number yeah, unfortunately, that those statistics also say, I think it's 16% mm-hmm. of the people who have returned, only mm-hmm. 16% um, have um, had some kind of pay increase. Since oh, then. okay, yeah. that's very interesting. So, so okay. With that being said, do you have you heard, you know, from from colleagues or just you know places you've worked with? Are people incentivizing more or did people try and bring back their workforce with the same, you know, structure, pay structures and bonuses and incentives that were kind of in place before, do you think? Um, A little bit of both, but more the latter. I think that there was just human nature, right? That the pendulum kind of swang here and here we are trying to get back, go back to something that's normal. Um, So I I do think a little bit of both, but I, I, I think, um, from my from my experience and my friends who are spa directors and spa operators, um, uh, it's 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 definitely going back to what it was before. Which is, I say that by no means mean that as a good thing because it really it really isn't a good thing. Yeah. Um, but there are yes, there are ways to um, incentivize their therapists. The issue is, you know, we now kind of have mental wellness on the table, whereas before we didn't. It was a bit too confronting. We work in a spa. It's not about, you know, not a business, not in our wheelhouse. But now we kind of have access to it. And because we have access to it, the demands on the therapists have certainly changed and grown. And we are looking for things like emotional intelligence. And um, and so it's very difficult to say to somebody, give us more for less or for the same, which yeah. effectively is less. Um, so it's very it's a very difficult situation because as the industry has grown before the pandemic, the industry the trajectory of the industry was was great. Yeah. But the pandemic obviously closed everything. Yeah. Um, but now wellness has a more has more of a fundamental role, I think, in people's lives. And because of that, the demands that we're putting on the people who deliver wellness have um, similarly grown um, Absolutely. and changed. Absolutely. And I think, you know, leaderships of those of those teams that are, you know, managing and leading uh, practitioners, you definitely have to be more, you know, emotionally receptive and empathetic to not only the workload, but how your practitioners are feeling, because at the end of the day, they are the bread and butter of the spa. Yeah, I mean, and and this is maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe off topic, but this, Mm -hmm. this is the important part now is the focus on work culture. And and the focus on, you know, um, the, the questions that we ask our therapists have changed as we're recruiting them. What fuels your passion should be a question. That, you know, and I always say this to spa directors, if you want, therap- therapists are emotional people. We are emotional people, we, you know. And what we would like is, um, is a way to anchor ourselves to the spa yeah. and creating an environment that, that empowers and supports a team of emotional people um, you know, while still understanding that it is a, you know, an environment of professionalism and business and standards, et cetera. But there, is, there should be, and there is, much more of a focus on, on the support of it. And 
and creating a work culture that um, is sustainable, but then also sustains um, the, the team. Um, and, and that's, and that's, that, that's, that, listen, for me and you, that's always been important. Yeah. But now it's, now it's more of a centralized um, focal point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything, you know, within the culture of a team, you know, really makes or breaks the team, you know, our practitioners, and I'm speaking totally from experience, we have to connect with so many clients per day, per week, per month on that emotional level, because they yeah. essentially, you know, come into our workspaces and, and we have to, our energy needs to connect, you know, we need to be empathetic to what they're coming in for, whether, you know, it's a physical element or like a, a mental detox element to just relax and stuff like that. So, you know, your practitioners really need that same support that they're giving hour by hour, sometimes for, you know, six to eight hours each day. Yeah. Listen, I, I would extend that outside of the practitioners as well. I mean, the spa, I mean, I, with all of my spas, I consider the receptionist therapists and I consider them part of the, you know, but the issue now, before the pandemic, there was globally a shortage um, a therapist. I mean, it, it, I've had discussions like this for, for several years. Yeah. Um, but the pandemic now, there's we've got it's threefold. It's um, people leaving the industry, um, uh, just a kind of a general lack of higher level training, and then um, a lot of therapists, a lot of therapists that I know personally, have decided to go freelance. But yeah. the, 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 the reason we just discussed, it's the priorities have shifted, and nice. people need you know, time with the families or whatever it is. So there are a lot of therapists that have decided to come out of that um, kind of nine to five corporate role and do freelance, and freelance. Absolutely. But for practitioners, so let me ask you this, for practitioners, therapists, the entire spa team, like you said, let's just refer to the entire spa team because, you know, it's an entire workforce. Yes, you're, there's your practitioners, yeah. but there are people, you know, co constantly, you know, taking reservations, desk team reservations, and, you know, assistant spa directors, spa managers, spa coordinators, uh, the head honcho, general managers, you know, it all. everybody's role plays a huge part in spa operations. How yeah. can spa directors keep practitioners engaged for the long run to ensure, you know, longevity within their teams? Do you find that, you know, team members that have a say within a certain, you know, line have, you know, that have a say in operations, uh, the menu add-ons, things like that, do you find that they are more engaged and uh, stick around longer? Yeah, I mean, it goes, it goes back to, to answer your question, surely, yes. Um, but it goes back to the psychology of ownership. You know, and, and then, as I just said, you know, yeah. we want to anchor ourselves to something. We want to feel that we belong. You know, we, we are brought into this industry, um, hopefully, for something in the ballpark of we want to nurture and heal and, and you know, that, those kind of those traits. And that, that's what drives us into this industry, whether we're therapists or, or developers like I am now. Um, and... I always, I said, I always say to my spa directors, put the passions of the therapist on the menu, because then the menu becomes a living, breathing document. You know, this, this, can you imagine being surrounded by eight, 10 therapists every day who are coming into work and doing what they love? Yes. And that's, that's, you know, it, and that is not mutually exclusive with the, um, the vision of the spa, it, you know, because the spa directors, in the same way in this industry, like there's a collection of, um, of developers like me and, you know, someone has told us that so we're in charge of explaining what wellness is uh, to everyone else. But wellness is actually amorphous. It means a thousand things to a thousand different people. Yeah. Then, the, with, spa, then with spa directors, <clears throat> you know, they come in with their vision and it's their vision at all cost. And that all cost, the cost part is the cost of therapists who are starved of this kind of connection to, to therapy. Yeah. I mean, this, I'm talking kind of in extreme cases, but, <laughs> but, but yes, to answer you, therapists need a place to belong. They need a place to exercise this desire to heal and to nurture. And Absolutely. ownership is a really great way to, to um, an involvement to keep the therapist feeling like they belong. And if it's, it's important 
for teams of therapists when they come in and they see their schedule that they don't see eight treatments they see eight people yes. and once once you can get them to a position where they are so excited about the opportunity to to teach someone to treat to treat someone um and less focused on the actual hands-on event itself then you've got yourself a group of people who will stay because Absolutely. they feel like they feel like they have the permission to be these beautiful energetic um healing nurturing therapists Absolutely. and so it's but then that kind of, kind of goes to the list of requirements from spa directors who have to be superheroes they have to <laughs> you know work work long hours um expense management um leadership um serene crisis management i mean the list the list the list of the list the list, list of attributes the list goes make, on and on <laughs> i mean it's, it's huge you know and then they have to then spa directors have to and quite often given no time at all yeah. have to interview um a, a therapist Mm -hmm. um, but then somehow figure out if that therapist, the, the work ethic of the therapist and all of the things that lay under the, the kind of the hands-on talent. Yes. And, and so it, it's kind of a, it's, it's a total mixed bag. And it, the role of a spa director, frankly, is kind of thankless. <laughs> and so it takes a very, which is why I'm not one um, because <laughs> I'm also, and because I'm also super emotional, but yeah. it's, it's, it's important for spa directors to show all of all of the empathy that is required to manage a team of emotional people, but yes. then have this kind of very level, kind of professional and personal fortitude. Absolutely. And that just kind of goes with any leadership role in general. You have yeah, to I would agree. with so many emotional beings on with different personalities and try and do what's best for everyone with having the end result be running a successful business you know as yeah. well and i think when when your team and your practitioners get to take that ownership of some of the operations you know components of running a successful spa uh you know like you mentioned earlier they come to work every day and they don't see eight appointments they see eight people that they're going to you know be super passionate about and when your therapist yeah. go into those treatments with that passion with that excitement because they know they're going to do you know treatment a on this person and they had a you know say so in it and what would work best you know treatment wise for this person and then they get to do you know maybe modality b you know on on their next sure. you know, batch of clients when they're really excited about stuff like that your clients are going to or your clients are just going to feel that energy of your therapist, yeah. which is going to result in, you know, extra exceptional reviews, you know, uh, whether that be, you know, online, or if you have a different review channel, which, and, you know, the biggest driver for the spa, always word of mouth, you know, and that's going yeah. to translate to, you know, gift cards for friends, you know, just telling friends, posting online, um, you know, really things like that. Social media has become huge. And I can't tell you, you know, and you, you're probably aware of this, so many review sites, you know, whether that be Google, Yelp, what have you, clients are calling practitioners out by name when they've yes. had these exceptional services that used yes. to happen to me like way back in the day and you know i used to see like reviews that said you know um please don't you know book this person because because i because i have a monthly standing appointment with them and but you know i just wanted to shout this person out so you know every little thing you may think you know adding you know a 15 dollar add-on to your menu is so minor, but if one therapist takes that one add-on, that one modality that they're extremely passionate about and knocks it out of the park, the domino effect of you know success just from doing that yeah. one little thing can go on and on for you know years potentially. I'll, I'll tell you, you. I think I said this to you before. You know, if I, it, it, I like it when somebody says, "Oh, I, you know, we're talking about my job and." if they've been to a spa that I've helped create, I really like it, I think it's interesting. But if they then bring up the name of a therapist in that spa, to me, I, I it kind of, it, the circle is complete because the, the bricks and mortar will take you so far, but it's the experience inside. And that's where you, it, it, 
you know, I mean, again, but it's also it's also culturally. I mean, I, I think in certain parts, I do a lot of work in Southeast Asia, and I don't mm -hmm. we don't necessarily have a, a, a retention issue there. Mm -hmm. But um, but in other areas of the world that I work, um, where opportunities are um, are more readily available, um, it's it's those kind of things. It's when therapists feel empowered yeah. enough to, enough to there's. I was taught a long time ago um, the difference between efficient and effective. Efficient people do things right. Effective people do the right thing. Yep. And you have to decide whether or not you want an efficient team or an effective team. And if somebody mentions a therapist by name, that to me is an effective therapist, not yep. efficient. Because efficient people go under the radar. They just come in, they clock in, they do the right thing, they're out. And yeah. there's no real engage. There's no real engagement. Um, but effective people, I mean, outside of our industry, I mean, effective people in general, but within this context of a spa, I'm an effective. An effective therapist is a therapist that has been engaged in the art of therapy, um, yes. and supported and empowered. And those are the people who don't want to leave that environment because it's because they are nurturers, and that environment is nurturing, and that's where it's important. But I'll tell you, because of what I do for a living, right? If my friends have a spa experience, I always have to hear about it. And what I've learned, what I've learned from that is um, they can go to a beautiful spa mm -hmm. and they cannot connect with the therapist. They, they could, they've had a good massage. The massage has been great, but they haven't connected. Yeah. Their perception of the experience airs towards negative it's either negative or at also. least it's airing that direct yeah. yeah if alternatively if they've gone to you know a spa that's not so great but they've they've had a the therapist is connected and they feel changed then their perception of the experience airs towards the positive so it's the it's the it, the standards i understand standards and the implementation of them i understand their role but what it does is make therapists robotic and those therapists, nobody, nobody interviews a therapist and says that person's gonna make a great robot, but then they bring them into the spa and they don't support their freedom to be a therapist. And that's, that's the engagement that spa directors need to achieve in order to, to retain their staff. Otherwise they'll just go through that, through that loophole again, that, that, that hamster wheel of, yeah. rehiring and retraining and all of those things have viable costs um it seems to me a false economy to have a, t a high turnover um because your vision is so stoic and uh, you know a bit, the spa ethos and spa vision is not a dogma it can move around and that's why i think there needs to be some flexibility especially in the market that is so dry of talent yes yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more giving your therapist that little bit of freedom and just I'm still laughing. <laughs> Nobody interviews and says, oh, you're going to make a great robot. When you give your therapist that freedom, that's why there are, you know, so many different avenues to take within this industry. What somebody's, you know, what one person's expertise is, you know, the other person, you know, maybe taking a little more, uh, a little longer to catch on to, or maybe their expertise is something totally different. And, you know, that's, where you know your your reception your your spa concierge desk you know that's where they come into play also with you know yeah. knowing and engaging with the practitioners so you know when somebody calls to book an appointment or where they're you know fielding you know the reservations line what have you they can make the best recommendation because just like you know clients call in for different elements or, you know, I'm looking for somebody, you know, really soft and gentle, or, you know, I need someone to, you know, drive their elbow into me, you know, what one therapist does best, another may not do best. And that's where, you know, freedom uh, comes into play. And, you know, just as a practitioner, and I've seen it, you know, managing my own teams, you know, they have more respect from, for their spa director, when you yeah. know you let them own their craft they've spent years you know they've taken it. you know state board exams country board exams uh, a million hours of you know continuing education over the years and even toggling off into specializing in certain modalities when they know that they can practice freely they're happier and you know they have they're excited and that passion is there i love it i love it when i hear spa directors say 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm often in environments where there's a journalist in the spot and I like it when the therapist will say to the spa director regarding the treatment with the journalist, what, so what do you want me to do? And the spa director says, just do your beautiful thing. Yep. And it's, it's, that's, all that, that's all that you need to do. And to your point about the education, therapist, you know, you don't get a therapist by putting a sign in a window. I mean, therapists have gone, therapists have gone through, you know, the common, the com which is the common route, not the normal route, but the common route with at least two years of training. And then invariably they've gone onto the ships. And if they have somehow managed to survive the ships and we get them left over from that terrible, torturous experience, you know, these, these people are super committed. And I don't, I've never met a therapist that I thought I knew more. Or I, I, I arrive in spas or I'm, doing, I'm building spas mm -hmm. and I, have, I find more questions than I do answers. You know, I, I, I get more information than I give always. And that information comes from teams of therapists. I, and I think that it's a, they're a completely exciting group of people. Um, but it's, it's the understanding. And I, I guess this goes back to what we we're talking about with pay. It's, it's the, the level of training that um, therapists have to get, even to get to kind of a lower level of, of skill, it still requires um, an excess amount of, of training and dedication, whether it's just hands-on, whether it's anatomy and physiology or whatever it is, these people have committed themselves fully to this, to this art of therapy. And it surprises me, um, or it did surprise me at the very beginning, and it surprises me now that, that therapists don't earn the money that would, if they had spent that, that amount of energy and that amount of time in education on another topic, Perfect. they probably would be earning much more than they're earning now. Absolutely. And they are so important to deliver wellness, to make somebody feel rested, de-stressed, empowered, whatever it is. That power, um, although you know, mostly from the side of the therapist, that power comes from a place of altruism, that power still deserves a dollar sign in front of it. And Absolutely. that's 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 the issue that we're facing. And yeah. if if we paid more, and then if we went down to the grassroots level and we introduced therapy in a different way at the colleges, um, I mean, it's been a while since, I will admit, since <laughs> I've been to, <laughs> since I learned. <laughs> Um, but I was never told that I could be um, an educator, a yeah. gift giver, a light healer. You yeah. know, I was never given these um, beautiful, in, this beautiful introduction to yeah. what therapy really is. Yeah. And we, it would be wonderful if we had more people coming into the industry who understood exactly what the industry um, was. And, and the multi facets and the multi dimensions. And it, you know, because I think at the very beginning, it's kind of like anatomy, hands on. And people are either disheartened or confused or, or not. I mean, we're not talking, you know, we don't talk about this kind of box populi, but, but it would be great if at the very, very beginning of all of this, at the very beginning of the journey in the schools, someone said to the therapists, you can be powerful, you can make transformations, you can do all of this within this industry, and we're gonna pay you appropriately to, to make all of those changes and differences. Yeah. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And I think, uh, when did I graduate? Um, 20, uh, it's 2022, so I graduated uh, 2012. Yeah, I've been doing this 10 years. Um, 2012, 2011, it really, they really, when I first, you know, entered into uh, massage therapy school, it was really then starting to, you know, drive home. And this is one of the things that I think has taken, uh, taken a little bit too long in the industry. It's not pitching massage therapy, you know, aesthetic. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. And I think sure. that has taken brands, you know, um, way too long to
to kind of realize for their practitioners, you know, in the team, you know, we hear massage, we're like, oh, you know, oh, you've worked so hard, you know, let's get a massage. But you know, people's people's bodies break down, whether you have a desk job, whether you're a construction worker, you know, what have you, everybody goes to, you know, seek a treatment for a different element or a different reason. And I think that, and I think that, you know, looking at, you know, treatments as more of a necessity than a luxury. Sure, you're in an absolutely stunning, beautiful five-star, Michelin star, whatever star environment. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, the treatment you received and, and the benefits of that treatment. Yeah, I agree with that. Look, I mean, people's, uh, to your point, if you're working in a five-star spa, I mean, there are already, a lot of expectations from the guest. I mean, the guest knows they're gonna, it's gonna look pretty. Um, they're gonna have a massage. It's gonna be excellent because it's an excellent spa and they're gonna feel a certain way. Yeah. But the job of the therapist is obviously to fulfill those expectations. Um, but but the, the art, I always call it the art of therapy. The art of therapy is to um, uh, get above those expectations. And no, nobody, nobody says I'm gonna have a, go out, I'm gonna have a massage, I'm gonna feel good, and I'm gonna have a human connection. No one says that. Yeah. So when they go into these environments, especially um, these environments that are just quite stark and cold, which is a whole other topic, um, <laughs> um, you know, where the, where the art, of, you know, the therapy doesn't begin and end on the bed. And no. that's something that we should fundamentally be tra 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 uh, training our therapists, that, that it's the human connection because the human connection allows you to become the therapist. Yes. Whereas, you know, and it, and it, and it secures that role because um, in order for me to, in order for me, like you can't see me as an employee and you right. can't really, you, you know, it can't be, you, you can't see me in three ways. You can't see me first as an employee, second as a therapist and first as a human being, you have to switch that over. Yep. Because in order for me to be a therapist and, and perform the art of therapy, you need to see me as a human being, first of all, um, because then we're going to share a little experience together. Then you see me as a therapist because there's a skill level that I need in order to perform whatever therapy it is for you. And then, you know, hopefully never, but maybe you see me as an employee. But, it, <laughs> but, but, it, but everybody should but be seeing everybody as a human being. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. point is, yeah. And. It, that kind of, you know, I call it, it you know, we, we, we play, all we do is play well, well, not all we do, what we do is mm -hmm. play wellness alchemy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to your point with the different parts of the teams, with the receptionists and the therapists and all the other um, components and people involved in the spa journey, it's all plant, it's all wellness alchemy. Yes. What we're trying to do is create an experience that is greater than each individual experience left alone. It all, sh it all should align itself. And this is the kind of mastery that people should be taught um, long, long before they find themselves in that situation. Almost from day one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the connection and the experience. But those things, again, I mean, those things are, um, uh, those things are a high level skill set because not everybody can achieve that. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's a difficult one because we are, it, as an industry as a whole, and it is changing, there's little, there's ripples, which I like to see, but as an industry as a whole, um, in, in my, in my opinion, we, for the large, for the most part, we see therapists as a labor force. And it's the word labor that I find um, insulting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, while we're on the topic of, you know, just culture within a team and you know respecting and knowing what people do as human beings practitioners employees there is you know that we touch a little bit there is that aspect that we touched a little bit on you know earlier and you know the roles and duties and you know the the connections that a spa director that a leader of the team has to have with their entire team i've noticed a lot of spa directors going from one prestigious brand to another recently do you think this shift is due to a genuine need for change or do you think some companies are beefing up their incentives for good leadership to join their teams um to tackle the last part 
Huh? Um, I hope I hope that's true. I I, I don't have that experience, and I, and I don't know if that's it, but I certainly hope that it's true. Yeah. Um, I've I've also seen spa directors shifting from one place to another, uh -huh. um, more so in the past. And I've always kind of put that down to this the general growth of the wellness industry and ergo wellness opportunities. Um, but we you know, but we all got bills to pay. So if, <laughs> right? so it it. It's understandable because spa directors don't earn, again, here we are on this subject of earnings, but spa directors earn a shocking, well, you know, you well, they earn a shockingly for the level of work, the level of hours, the level of experience and expertise, the managing of uh, the, the somehow turning emotional experiences into dollars, um, you know, all of these level, and they, they really don't earn a lot of money. Um, so I would imagine, yes, the spa directors always have kind of one eye open for, um, a, a better, more more fruitful opportunity, I, I, I would imagine. Um, and then also you look at companies that are just generally expanding their wellness profile or, or, or even just introducing one. I mean, I work a lot with hotels that have no wellness profile and they, so we're developing wellness concepts and it's really great to get spa directors in at the very beginning of that development process because again, ownership. Yeah. Um, but. But yeah, I think there's, I, I, I certainly hope that there, there are more fruitful opportunities and they're going to them and companies are beefing up their kind of salary packages. I certainly hope that's true. Um, right. Around the world, the projects that I have around the world, I always tend to see, um, uh, we always tend to put in the budgets uh, what spa, the average kind of spa director salary is in the United States, and then we throw some on top of that, um, not to kind of upset the cap, the apple cart so much, but just because um, uh, their the role, their role is spectacularly important, and they are going to govern. They're going to be the gatekeeper of an experience that we have all created together, and I would like to keep them. And Absolutely. so, yeah, <laughs> and, and so we absolute. always. <laughs> so I go, yeah, go. and I can absolutely speak to your point there. There would be some weeks that you know I would be doing you know the commission, the commissions for some of my massage therapists, and I'd be like, "Why did I get I, into managing this team again?" <laughs> it's the truth. I, I like, hear this. They're a lot. making double what I'm making yeah. to not only have you know two assistant spa managers, but you know, like just being a practitioner. Like, should I get back in the room? And like, why did yeah. I choose this? I hear this. I, I hear this a lot from spa directors, but, and exactly that experience when they're dishing out the commissions. They're like, oh, okay, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how can general managers, resort managers of properties, ensure that they are hiring a really strong spa director or spa manager to lead these spa teams? Should this be a conversation around you know strong KPIs or emotional intelligence, or a bit of both? Um, a bit of, a bit of both, um, um, you know, there are obviously kind of leadership KPIs of it. I mean, these are just kind of, you know, just those kind of, I mean, mentioned it, the expense management and, uh, forecasting and all of that. So, yeah. Um, but given the, given the change of profile for the wellness industry, as it is now, I would think that they are looking for, I would hope at least that they are looking for um, a level of emotional intelligence and a level of commitment as well. You know, it's we're in a weird position, people like us, because as I said before, we have to turn, we speak emotion, hoteliers speak numbers, and somehow in the middle, you and I have to turn emotion into numbers. Yep. And that's the tricky part. And that's why that's the role of a spa director but, but the spa director profile has changed because wellness has changed. So they're not, you know, wellness in a hotel is no longer a facility anymore. You know, your room's not ready, here's a massage, your dinner was cold, here's a massage. And so we don't need somebody to manage a facility. What we need is somebody to develop and nurture um, a, a, a viable revenue generating uh, you know, for, uh, the space, something that will drive rooms, because we, we look, we look at where the wellness profile is with hospitality now, and quite often, it's, well, quite often in that, in that environment, it's rooms driving wellness, but, but it, 
more hoteliers are understanding that wellness can also drive rooms. And so there has to be a sense of um, innovation and, and drive for the wellness industry. It's not enough. There's a difference between managing a spa and developing a spa. There's a difference between managing people and developing people. And so spa directors um, at some point will morph and, it, and as, as they are already, I imagine, will morph into spa developers because that's really their role. Their role isn't to direct a team. Their role is to develop a team. And so um, the, the, what hoteliers, when they're hiring spa directors, what they need to bounce, um, what they're looking for off of is the condition of the wellness industry as a whole. Because if they understand the wellness industry, they understand the, the expectations of a spa director. And um, as I said, it, it's just not enough anymore to have these very kind of traditional kind of day spa, beauty spa KPIs, because that's, that is a part of the industry, but it's not a part of uh, a, a resort spa or even a, you know, a, a hotel spa. Yeah. But those kind of very traditional, you know, those kind of stark spa director uniforms and this kind of approach to, um, this kind of very kind of cold approach to, to, to wellness as if it was a beauty salon, that kind of very old <laughs> traditional spa director profile, for yeah. the most part has gone. Um, and so expectations will change. For our and, I think, and I think the, the word that best describes, you know, just everything you just said, you know, be, uh, you know, we're requiring, you know, spa directors, these leaders of teams to be, you know, people developers, brand developers, yes. business developers. And well, you know, being on the forefront of innovation, I think the word to sum that all up the best would be you really have to hire the most adaptable person because the industry yes. was changing, you know, pre-pandemic, it's like majorly changing, you know, post-pandemic, you really want to have leadership in place that just because, you know, they've done something, you know, one way for the past, you know, 10 years of their career. And, you know, it may have worked and you could take, you know, little tidbits of, you know, success, but as long as you have that person opening, opened up to, you know, being versatile and, you know, adaptable within a business model, I think you'll have success regardless fluidity fluidity i think in most business models fluidity and adaptability are, are, are crucial but yeah. it's it's it kind of goes back to you know to to what we were saying before about efficient yeah efficient an efficient spa director will run a spa efficiently an effective spa director will do will it will grow it will change and it will adapt with with the fluidity of this kind of amorphous definition that we have um, of, of, of wellness or, or amorphous, there is no definition, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and so, and so spa directors have to understand that there is no one experience for all, yep. that there has to be fluidity, there has to be give and take, um, you know, but also an understanding of who is now coming to spas because the people who are coming to spas now on, are different than the people who came to spas 10 years ago, 100%. but more importantly, that. Yeah, but they're different than the people who are coming to spas before the pandemic. But the drivers, the key drivers to, of people to get them into spas has changed. The questions that guests ask themselves, you know, can I afford it? Went to kind of, can I risk it? And now that, you know, and now, now those key drivers are changing as well. So it's, it's important for spa directors to be able to manage a team, understand the growing and evolving industry, um, know how to funnel that into, the, the, their own spa experience and tell you it's a difficult one that, that job <laughs> <laughs> absolutely all right Nigel you've gave us so much insight and so much and stellar grand advice today I want to learn we want to learn just a little bit more about you so I'm going to move on to the spa leader Masterclass series Fast five. Nigel, what time do you start your day? 5.30 in the morning. Almost the same. With, uh, what with meditation. Learn, what was that? With meditation. I have 5.30 meditation every day. Meditation. That's an excellent yeah. way to start the day and decompress before you dive right in. It's all about transcendental meditation. All right, sorry, go ahead. This is a quick fast. <laughs> it's 5.30. <all right. laughs> what is your 
you might upset some people. What is your favorite okay. spa treatment? Whether that be massage, facial, body, mani pedi. Uh, watsu. Okay, very interesting. You know, Are you, you a coffee you know or tea? Yeah, I'm familiar. Uh, Why don't you? Yeah. Well, while we're getting into detail, why don't you explain that for anyone who doesn't know what that is? Uh, watsu is uh, water shiatsu. It's, um, yeah, it's in a pool and the therapist, um, it's like a water dance and uh, your watsu therapist will then sometimes even sink with your breath and take you under the water. It's the most um, womb-like emotional transformative experience ever. Everybody should have watsu. And I can almost guarantee if a therapist, a practitioner walks into a spa with, you know, uh, a pool or an aqua center and they have that on their resume, I can tell you right now, you'll hit it out of the park just by probably sure. being one of the few practitioners that do practice that. I, I, I'll tell you, I won't, I will rarely even um, create a spa without a Watsu pool now. Wow. It's such an important, yeah, it's such an important treatment. Wow. So, um, are you a coffee or tea guy? Uh, tea. tea. I haven't had caffeine in seven years. Oh wow! Congratulations on on Thanks. being so on being have, having such great energy and completing you know twelve hour days on. Could you imagine me on coffee? <laughs> if you could visit one place in the world tomorrow, where would you go? Uh, Tromsø in Norway to see the Northern Lights. Very nice. And what is something that you wish that you knew when you were twenty? Oh. What is something that I wish I knew when I was, I can't, I don't know. Ah, oh, you caught me off guard with this one. <laughs> um, uh, what is, um, I wish I knew then that the only thing this, and I say this because this is something my mother used to say. The only thing that I don't have is the experience that I have everything I need. And I wish I've had that experience now. And I wish at 20, I understood that I already had everything I need. I think that's it, relatable it took me to a, long time. a ton of people. Yeah. yeah. I just needed the experience that I already have it. Yeah. And I didn't know that at 20, I was looking for it. But at, but at 50, I'm, I have it. I already know that I have it. But you have it. All right. Yeah, always do Nig it. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Franklin, aka the that's Spa awesome. Whisperer. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, so my pleasure. Thanks. And thanks everybody for, for uh, tuning in. Of course. And thank you at home or at work for tuning in and being a part of the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series. I'm Sal Capizzi. I'll see you next time.